Uh, hello, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here in this amazing conference uh, and uh, good afternoon or good morning. I don't know where uh, from where you are attending because I believe for most of the people it is middle of the day, but for others maybe it is uh, early in the morning. For example, for me it is seven o'clock and uh, perhaps it is uh, the earliest talk that I ever given. So thank you for attending and uh, as I told, I'm very happy and excited to be in NDC Sydney. And in this session, we are going to talk about some practical applications of machine learning in software testing stages. Before deep diving into the subject, let me briefly introduce myself. My name is Misut and I'm from Turkey, Istanbul. I'm working for Siemens Istanbul office and uh, I'm a QA engineer for uh, more than 12 years. Uh, I have experience on test automation and uh, some uh, little machine learning practices on software testing stages. So I will uh, share my experiences and some uh, samples uh, about how we can adapt machine learning into our uh, software testing stages. You can find some contact information for me. Please do not hesitate to reach out to me for any questions, any recommendations, and just feel free to uh, contact to me. So this is the brief agenda for this talk. Uh, as I told, we will uh, go over some applications and some examples of applications in which we can uh, get help from machine learning for our software testing uh, stages. I will try to do that with a systematic manner. I mean, we will go over one by one, starting from the uh, start of the software testing lifecycle till the end. We will go over each uh, stage, what uh, we will see what we can do. Uh, with the collaboration of machines and the human beings. But first of all, in the first part, uh, I will start with a quick reminder. We will all uh, quickly remember how it works. I mean, we will check the background and we will uh, check the working uh, principles of the algorithms. Uh, maybe most of the people already know that, but we will check this from the software testing perspective. We will investigate the learning terminology in terms of software testing, and then we will uh, check the applications and finally, Finally, at the end, I will share a case study in which uh, I try to uh, classify the bugs. In our project, we have some bugs in different severity levels. And what I did is uh, try to uh, predict the severity level of the bugs by reading their uh, summary or description areas. Uh, I will share some uh, results and uh, we will see uh, a little representation of the data set. Okay, let's start with uh, the reminder parts, the introduction parts in which uh, we will see uh, the working principle and the background of the algorithms. But first of all, let's investigate uh, why we are doing this, why we are uh, searching for some adaptations of machine learning, why we are bothering ourselves, right? Because most of the data scientists, most of the researchers are heavily working on machine learning algorithms, but as software testers, are we really closely related to the subject? Let's start with this point. Yeah, because we are searching for uh, some adaptations, we are searching for help uh, from machines because we have some challenges, right? And today's uh, software market, nowadays we have a great uh, rivalry. Everyone is trying to be the first in the market. Everyone is in a rush. They are all uh, adapting to different platforms. They are all integrating uh, latest technology. So we have a complex structure and which, uh, which is uh, to be verified in a very small testing window. We have a limited time and we have a very complex structure. And we are working in an agile environment. I mean, we are encountering lots of uh, and uh, too many frequent changes and updates. updates. So those are the challenges for us. In most of the time, I have a testing window, for example, let's say uh, half an hour or one hour uh, before going production. And I have lots of test cases to do. And sometimes we feel desperate, right? Because it's really hard to cover everything. Sometimes we need some help from some other one or someone else. Okay, at this point, who can help us? Maybe uh, the machines can help us. Let's uh, try to uh, find some answers to this question. We already know that the machines are created by human beings, right? So they have some uh, limited capacity at some manner and they do not have emotions. They are machines, they are not human beings. Okay, we can still uh, argue that uh, having an emotion or not having an emotion is an advantage or a disadvantage. These are the uh, points that we know already, but uh, machines or robots can 
uh, or uh, have already some uh, definite advantages. For example, they do not get uh, tired. Because we do at the end of a long working day, maybe I'm already tired, exhausted and I want to go home. It's it is already uh, a long day and I worked uh, so much and uh, my motivation goes down. So I want to go home, I want to leave the office and uh, at that point it is very likely to miss some uh, miss some uh, bugs. Maybe uh, my concentration is not very high and uh, I can overlook some bugs or vulnerabilities in the product. But for the missions it is not the case. They are uh, performing almost at the same level for all time. So they do not get tired and they do not forget. I mean if you put an information inside to a machine then it is there, right? Unless you delete it. But for me, as a human being, I'm not a machine, so I can forget. I can do the same mistake for the second time. So machines can really reduce these kind of uh, risks. And when we need some additional resources, it is much more easier to add an additional machine. I can immediately create a virtual machine and uh, add to my uh, data pool, right? It is that easy. In uh, today's technology, it is not that hard, but if I uh, need an additional colleague in my team, then I will put an additional resource. I will increase the headcount. Okay, but uh, we will need some adaptation time. He or she will not immediately perform. He or she will first uh, learn how it works. Uh, he or she will uh, adapt to the environment and we will need some time to get some performance. And we already see that uh, machines uh, are overbeating the human beings. For example, uh, maybe most of the people uh, knows the story about uh, Go uh, game. It is one of the most uh, complex uh, game uh, games. Uh, for example, it is uh, maybe ten or hundred times uh, complex uh, from chess. And at that game, uh, the machines uh, already and the algorithms already uh, beat the champions of the games. So, uh, at some manner, machines are performing better than human beings because they have some uh, very uh, good and large capacity to analyze data and analyze all the scenarios. So, we will uh, try to utilize this uh, kind of advantages and we will try to get some help uh, from the machines and from the algorithms. And we see that they are already being used widely in uh, some different platforms. For example, on this table, uh, I put some uh, example platforms or, or commercial tools uh, which are using AI. Uh, and uh, these, uh, the purpose of these applications are just uh, software testing activities. But apart from that, we are already seeing these applications in our daily life, right? For example, uh, today I uh, wrote a text, uh, I wrote a reply to one of my emails. I started texting and after you just write hi, then it is completed by the name of the sender, right? You, you already know this. And these kind of applications are making life easier for us. I mean, I don't have to complete uh, the rest of the text manually. It is automatically completed because it knows how it works. It knows uh, my past experiences. It learned from my past experiences and it predicts what I will do next. For example, sometimes my smartphone warns me to go out, to leave the house, to reach my office because uh, it says that otherwise you will be late to the office. Because how does it know? Because it knows uh, usually what time I'm leaving home, at what time I'm starting work, and it uh, knows the level of the traffic in where I live. So uh, observing all these uh, observations and experiences, then machine learns uh, some usual uh, ordinary uh, patterns and then predicts the upcoming uh, samples. So uh, we will uh, investigate how it works in especially software testing stages, but it works uh, in a very uh, similar way. But before that, let's uh, discuss uh, for, a, uh, for a while uh, what learning means. Learning is uh, something uh, which is not uh, or which is different than uh, memorizing something or being explicitly programmed. But uh, what is the uh, difference and what is the important point here is when uh, you learn something, you know the working principle and you know how it works. Uh, for example, let's go over some examples. When I show you an image, uh, which is on the slides at the bottom side, 
I can, you can uh, predict or you know what it is, right? It's a chair or it's a special coach on which you can sit. But how do you know? Because most probably you did not see this before. It's most probably the first time that you see this image. And it doesn't look like the ordinary chairs. I mean, with four legs and it is not a classical, but it is a modern uh, style chair or coach. But we know uh, how it works, right? We know the way it works. I mean, we can sit on it and uh, we know the functionality. So it is not one to one, one of the past samples, but still uh, we know how it works and we can predict what it is. And when a child touches uh, to uh, something on the oven, for example, uh, when he touches uh, to a, a cup of tea, he will uh, feel the pain in his fingers, right? And because uh, at first time he doesn't know that he shouldn't uh, touch it. But in the next time, after his uh, first experience, then he can uh, stay away from uh, the oven, right? Even if it is not uh, a cup of coffee anymore, maybe it is. it will be a cup of tea this time. It will not be one-to-one -one the same thing. But still, he knows that uh, it, is, uh, he, uh, it is on the oven and it can be hot and it can hurt uh, himself. So after uh, learning the uh, principles of the working way, uh, we will uh, or we can have some uh, needed uh, action items and the predictions. And it is not a, a very actually machine learning algorithms is not a very uh, new area. Actually, uh, the studies on this area started on 1980s. Alan Turing was one of the first uh, guys and the scientists uh, in the field, and he had an article in 1950. Uh, and at that time, he was questioning if the machines can think or if the machines can learn. So he had the courage to ask these kind of questions because at that time, the machines can think. It's a really difficult question, right? So, uh, and from that time, uh, the algorithms are improved and uh today we have uh, lots of uh, strong algorithms which can uh, make some uh, strong and uh, correct accurate uh, predictions and i can say most of them are uh, inspired by uh, the biological learning our biological learning for example in this one we uh, see an example when uh, we see an object coming uh, clo uh, getting closer to us uh, we see that, right? And we understand what it is. For example, when a cat is uh, getting closer to us, uh, we notice that a cat is coming. Okay, but how we do understand that the object is a cat? Okay, we are concentrating on some uh, features. For example, uh, we see the size of the object. For example, at the first time uh, something is coming to me, then I understand it can be a lion, right? Because it is not that big. It is uh, the size of the object can be maybe a cat, maybe a rat, maybe maybe a dog, I don't know, but it is definitely not a lion, maybe not an elephant. It's not that big. And then I see the color and I see some other uh, features, for example, uh, how many ears or how, what else uh, it has and lots of other uh, features. So I'm processing a gradual process in my mind, I mean. First of all, uh, I said uh, the first uh, feature is the size, right? So first of all, I'm uh, processing the outermost frame when I see the object. The light is coming from my eyes, is entering from my eyes, and I process the outermost frame and go gradually. The next feature, the next feature, and at the end, I decide that it is a cat. So for the machine learning algorithms, it works in the similar way. For example, for the neural network uh, algorithms, uh, just like in our body, some neurons are activated and they are transforming the information to the other one. So in this way, uh, the features are extracted from the information, from the data, and over the features, we are uh, performing our decision. So uh, the information and the data is uh, a very important aspect at this moment, because if we do not have uh, sufficient information, we cannot make the uh, learning or teaching uh, procedure, right? First of all, we need a sufficient data to teach to machines. And then machines are observing all the patterns 
and constructing a model. Okay, if some data is in front of me with this range, then this kind of action item that I have to have. According to the model, it uh, makes its predictions, and at the end, we can evaluate its uh, performance. If it is not a very successful one, then we can update the, the model or the algorithm itself. So for the software testing, it really works very similarly. I mean, as a software tester, if you come to me and ask to me to test your system, my response would be, okay, I can test your system, but first of all, teach me how your system works. I mean, uh, what are the expected results? What are the, uh, when I'm clicking something on your system, what should I expect? Because otherwise I will not have the expected results, right? And without expected result, I cannot perform my test cases. I cannot execute my scenarios. Maybe I can execute, but I will have some results and I don't know if it is the correct one or not. So first of all, you should teach me how uh, your system works. Even if it's an API or a, a UI, the front end, for example, for an API, I can, uh, or, or I can teach myself. I mean, I can explore your system and for example, if there are some APIs, then I can send some queries, okay? And if my uh, query is a, a request, which is an unauthenticated one, most probably I will get a 400 response, right? Not 400, but 403 or four, which is the unauthenticated response. So I will see that I will observe that, okay, this system uh, requires some authentication and authorization. I already learned that by observing by explore, exploitation. And if it's a front end, I can just click on buttons and see uh, where I'm navigating to. I can uh, go different pages. I can see uh, what kind of buttons there are on the pages and how they work. For example, I can fill some fields and just uh, submit the form and see if I will go to another image or if a pop-up will uh, appear on the screen another image will appear. So I can do all uh, this kind of uh, explorations. And after I see what kind of uh, results are coming, then those are the uh, assumptions that those are the expected results for me. So the machines can do the same thing automatically. They can explore just the pages. They can see all the images. They can see really because we can do some visual recognitions. The machine can detect what kind of images there are or what kind of buttons there are on the pages. And uh, according to our problem, if it's a supervised or unsupervised learning, we can uh, apply some different algorithms. For example, in my case study, uh, which uh, I will share at the end, it's a supervised uh, learning problem because I have some bugs and I have already some labels on them. I already know uh, which severity level it has. Maybe it's several to two, three, four, any one of uh, them. And uh, according to the problem, we can adapt uh, a relevant uh, algorithm. And after this introduction section, uh, let's start uh, seeing what we can uh, do with the help of machine learning in different software testing stages. So this is an ordinary uh, life cycle of the software testing st uh, stages, the uh, software testing life cycle. It starts with the analysis of the requirements, right? And then we design our test cases and we implement them because nowadays most of us are dealing with the automation of test cases. So we develop a uh, test code and we integrate them into our uh, CI/CD pipelines. And then we schedule some jobs and automatically execute them. And finally, if we find any vulnerability or uh, some bugs on the product, then we report them to the developers, to the uh, product owners, to uh, anyone in the team. So this is the uh, classical life cycle of software testing. And there are some relationships between consecutive, uh, two consecutive uh, cycles. I mean, when we analyze the requirements, then we uh, design our test cases, right? But there is a traceability between these two. I mean, we map the test scenarios to the use cases. There is a, a relation between them. And after that, after we uh, design uh, our test cases, then we develop our code. And in each uh, method or class, we annotate uh, 
across which test case we develop those code, right? We uh, build a mapping between these two. So we will use this uh, input output relationship between uh, each uh, two cycles. And uh, according to the inputs, we will be uh, trying to predict the outputs. And let's start with the first one. The first one is the test uh, case generation uh, stage. What we can do with the help of machines in test case uh, generation stage? Let's say this. Again, uh, the same way uh, we will uh, observe the uh, input output relationship at what kind of inputs we are having some outputs. We will investigate this relationship and after learning what kind of relationship is there, then we will construct our model and for the upcoming inputs, we will predict the outputs. Let's start with the API side and then we will uh, jump to the uh, front end side, the UI automation. First of all, uh, for the API side, I will, I will illustrate this with a sample uh, scenario, with an example. It will be more clear uh, by observing this example, I believe. So on this example, we have an API of a library. In the library, we have lots of books, right? And uh, when uh, and we can query the books uh, inside the library, or we can uh, pull a specific book by giving the ID of the book. Or when uh, as a as the administrator, when uh, we have a new book, I can add the book to the library as well. I can post, I can create a new object representing to the uh, book. So when I'm uh, investigating this system, this API, I can send some requests uh, to the endpoints, right? For example, I can uh, list all the books. And when I get the response, then I will have a clue about uh, the structure of the data. I mean, I will see, okay, there is uh, the, in the inside the response, there are some book entities. And in the book, each book entity, we have some ISPN numbers, we have price, we have the published year of the book. And what I know is uh, the year uh, is represented with a number, with an integer double, what it is, with, with a specific number type. So I know uh, I know which uh, data type is used to represent these different fields. So after this point, after I know uh, the structure of the data and the structure of the uh, responses request, what I can do is next, I can uh, create some additional uh, requests and responses automatically. I mean, I can inject some data uh, values into these fields because I know what I should put in this uh, data areas, right? I should put some, uh, for example, to uh, try to create a new book, try to send a create uh, post uh, request. I I know what I should uh, put into these fields. For example, I should put a, a number into year uh, field, or I should put a string value into ISPM field, and I can inject some uh, values inside, and I can test uh, the uh, generated. Uh, request and I can do uh, I can generate some negative cases as well for example uh, since I know that I should put some numbers into year uh, field maybe I will uh, put some negative values right into the year field then already I generated a negative case as well so after uh, understanding the model of the data the model of the system then uh, the generation of the test cases is uh, not that uh, difficult. And for the UI parts, uh, let's again go over an example. Let's say today uh, I go to an online shopping site and uh, I ordered something uh, online. This is maybe one of the uh, things that we do most frequently nowadays, right? In the uh, lockdown uh, days. We mostly buy something online over some uh, shopping sites. And today, uh, when I go to an online shopping site, it was the first time for me to use that site. I never used it before. But still, I was able to order something. I was able to buy something. And how was that possible? Because, okay, I did not use that site before. But I used some other sites, which is working very similar to that one. So when I see a basket on the page as an icon, I know what uh, it means. I know uh, the functionality of the button. 
because for most of the time it works uh, similarly and I recognize uh, for what it works from my past experiences. In my in the other sites that I went before, I used that uh, image or that icon uh, in the similar way. So I recognize it from my past experiences. <coughs> I learned it for, in my past experiences, and now I know uh, how to use that. So for the machines, it works similarly. Uh, we can teach uh, to them over a wide range of data, over wide range of uh, images, and each icon. Uh, the, uh, we can teach the functionality of each icon. For example, this uh, set is uh, taken from Tested AI uh, platform. They have an open uh, repository, so you can go and check it. Uh, and uh, after uh, doing this teaching, then the machine can uh, predict the functionalities of the icons. So if it sees that there is a, a basket icon, uh, it knows that it's the uh, shopping cart, right? And it can generate some test cases to uh, order something and at the next step it will go into the cart and see if the ordered items are inside or not. So the relevant test cases can be generated automatically in this way and uh, we can generate uh, test cases to test our uh, user interface uh, system as well. After the test case are designed, what we are doing is to uh, generate some test code, right? And uh, develop our test code. Uh, for this uh, test case generation, test code generation, we have some alternatives. For example, this is again another example uh, from a uh, different platform. In this one, uh, we are, uh, the, the methods and the classes are investigated. And they are uh, investigating what uh, what are there in the uh, in the methods or in the classes? For example, uh, there's an addition operation in the uh, in one of the methods. Let's say, then the method is called because it already observes that uh, observed that uh, there's a, a callable method inside the class, and it is uh, triggered with some parameters. And it is much more easier if uh, we have documentation in our methods and classes, and uh, it can analyze the documentation of the method and class and uh, it can call the methods uh, with uh, different uh, parameters with some uh, corner values and uh, positive and negative values and it will uh, investigate the results. Uh, the returning value is uh, taken into consideration and uh, checked if it is the expected value or not. It is one way of uh, generating test cases but apart from test code, any code can be automatically generated. Again, uh, utilizing the input-output relationship. For example, in, uh, on the slide, we have an example. We have an input-output pair. If I ask uh, you people, uh, the audience, uh, what is the relationship between input and output? Will it be uh, very quick to understand what is the relationship? I don't think so. Maybe some of you already figured out what the relationship is, but for the machines, it is performed in milliseconds. It can. Uh, quickly understand that all the values are multiplied with 4 from the input and all the positive values are filtered out. We see only the negative values in the output and all of them are the multiplications of the input values with 4. And they are sorted from uh, starting from uh, the biggest one to the negative one. And we have a sorting algorithm at the end. So the needed operations are multiplication with 4 uh, filtering out the positive values and the sorting algorithm. So after uh, understanding this, to uh, inject the uh, needed code inside is very simple, right? Because uh, multiplication with four, we already know the code to do that. So the challenging part here is to understand the input-output relationship. When we have a, a upcoming input, upcoming sample, what will be the uh, result of that? What will be the outcome of that? The challenging point is uh, to make this prediction and after we do that, uh, adapting the uh, code is the simple part. And apart from uh, developing the code from scratch, we can uh, adapt some uh, completion, auto-completion uh, algorithms as well, uh, just as the emailing example. 
when we uh, start typing something, it can be automatically completed because it knows our past uh, patterns. When I start with you, most probably I will complete with unsigned, right? Because it saw it from my past experiences, past uh, patterns. So we can do uh, auto completion as well to make life easier for us. And for the UI parts, uh, I think most of the software testers are uh, aware of this, uh, aware of the challenge for UI automation. For most of the time, the locators are changing, right? You put an ID as a locator to recognize, to uh, locate some elements on the page, and the next day the ID is changed. It's updated by the developers. Shit, our test is broken. So we, we, we have to deal with uh, it and we have to maintain it. And the, okay, after you update it, again, maybe the next day, we are not sure if it will be changed again or not. So uh, it needs a really maintenance effort. So to avoid this maintenance effort, what we can do is, instead of using these traditional locators, maybe we can do some uh, visual recognitions. For example, uh, instead of uh, using the expect selector or the uh, just ID of the element, we can uh, directly recognize the element itself on the page by visual recognition. So this is again from uh, test.ai, uh, from the open repository. Uh, they have some code to get all the elements from the page and find the element that we want to locate. So in this way, we will not have to deal with lots of maintenance and analysis effort. And we are continuing. After designing and developing, the next thing we are doing is uh, we are ready to execute them because we already developed them. Now we can execute our test cases. And during the, during the execution, what we can do with the help of machines, with the, co with the collaboration with the machines, we can, uh, during the execution, we can collect lots of data, lots of information. For example, let's think about that. What we can collect from our executions. Maybe we can collect the execution duration, right? For example, I started one of my test cases, I'm executing it, and I can calculate or uh, I can uh, check how long it's uh, long. For example, in the first execution, maybe it was uh, 30 seconds. And after a while, after I collect all the data, I have some insights about the execution duration. For example, it was 30 seconds, 32 seconds, 28, 31, lots of values around 30 seconds. Then I, sh uh, I learned that the execution uh, duration needed for this test case is around 30 seconds. And if one of the execution, in one of the executions, it is not 30 seconds, but 45 seconds, then it means that I'm detecting an anomaly because normally I was expecting something around 30 seconds, but now it's 45 seconds. So it's an anomaly for me. And uh, I have some insights, uh, I have some predictions about uh, there is something wrong in that execution. Maybe the uh, service did not respond in time, or maybe there was something else uh, which was wrong uh, in the execution. So I can detect automatically uh, the uh, unexpected executions in this way because otherwise it is not easy otherwise i will uh, go to each execution and check each of them one by one in this one what was the duration in the other one what was the duration i will check all of them manually so it is really cumbersome and it is not uh, easy and it really uh, it needs really time and uh, cost and some effort and after the executions, uh, the next uh, cycle in our life cycle is uh, the maintenance uh, stage. And in the maintenance stage, what we do is uh, to refactor our code because mo uh, in most of the cases, uh, our test code can be improved and the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities in the code can be found. So we can improve our code. And how uh, are we doing that is generally if we are performing a peer review, I'm writing my code and sending to uh, a colleague of mine in the team and here he or she reviews it and sends it back to me. So again, we need a, a lot of time to do that. I'm sending her, she's sending it back to me. I'm again correcting it, then sending it uh, to her again. It, it needs lots of time. 
but instead of that we can do that automatically because we have some checkpoints uh, we have a checklist to uh, perform a code review so if we teach this checklist to the machines then the machines can do it instead of us right for example if we teach the machines that uh, applying this pattern is an anti-pattern it is not a best practice for example having some uh, magical numbers in the code there are some embedded codes there are some uh, there are some numbers in the code and i don't know the definitions of them it's a magical number so uh, it is not a uh, expected and it is not the best practice so if we teach machines to this principle then in the next run if it detects some numbers, magical numbers in the code, it will warn us. So it can uh, perform uh, this kind of checklist that we taught uh, to the machines. And uh, uh, in the scope of maintenance, uh, what else we can do? Maybe a self-healing uh, can be performed. I mean, when a test case is broken, then it can predict what is uh, the root cause for the uh, failure. I mean, when uh, we are expecting for some uh, uh, elements on the page when it is not found maybe the ma machine will predict uh, maybe it was uh, changed with another one so it will uh, suggest us some uh, solution ways some other ways to uh, solve the problem i mean uh, do you want to uh, change this element with another one because most probably it is updated with that one again it makes some predictions and makes some suggestions to us to automatically uh, solve the problem and automatically heal the test case. And we are closing to the end of the life cycle. Uh, in the scope of maintenance, what we can do uh, is uh, one uh, another thing is the prioritization because infinite testing is not possible, right? Sometimes we have to prioritize test cases because I cannot execute infinite number of test cases. Come on, I'm a human being. so. I have to select a subset and go with this uh, kind of uh, test cases. But which test cases should I select? Most probably the, the most prior ones. And which are the most prior ones? Okay, I can do the prioritization according to my uh, privileges. I mean, if I'm uh, tending to uh, select the cases which are most likely to find some bugs, then I can select uh, the test cases, which are most likely to find some bugs. And we can do this selection uh, again, uh, according to the past experiences. In the past uh, runs, maybe uh, one test case was most likely to find some bug when we are testing, uh, when we are performing a regression test. So again, in my next, next run, I can uh, put uh, the uh, select the test case into my set. So, uh, by the help of uh, past experiences, again, I can do a prioritization with the help of uh, machine learning algorithms. And finally, uh, with the uh, bug management, we can do a, a severity assignment or assignment to uh, someone else as the responsible, or we can do some uh, clustering on the bug. I mean, we can clusters, uh, we can monitor some clusters on the bug. We can group them. I will not go uh, too much in detail uh, in this one because uh, I will uh, show some examples uh, from the case study uh, for the uh, bug management cases. Okay, now let's see how uh, the uh, case study look like, uh, looks like. In this study, uh, I used real uh, data uh, from my project. And in this project, normally we have six different severity levels, starting from one uh, to six. But we don't have any uh, severity one issues because in our project, severity one means which is the uh, bugs which is related to human life. For example, in if you have some hardware in your project and if there is a current leakage and it can uh, harm a human body or uh, it will uh, affect human life, then uh, they are severity one, and actually we don't have any severity one. So severity two, three, uh, four, five, and six. But severity six and five are the ones which are not real bugs, but they are regarded as change requests. 
So for the actual box, we have three classes, two, three, and four. And totally, we have in this project uh, around uh, 400 bugs reported by the developers or the uh, customers and users. And uh, over these uh, 900 uh, samples, uh, I separated the data, uh, a portion uh, for the training and a portion for the testing. And uh, over the samples uh, where I'm testing the uh, success of the algorithm, I'm hiding the labels. For example, normally uh, we have some severity levels again. Some people uh, from the team put a, a severity level. For example, maybe they put severity two on some samples. They put severity three on some others. But when I'm testing the success of the algorithm, I'm hiding these labels and I'm asking uh, the severity label to the machine. And it is predicting for me. It is saying that, okay, I'm reading now uh, the uh, description or the summary of this bug, and most probably it will be 72 because uh, I analyzed all the other ones you gave me during the training, and I believe this should be 72. This is the prediction of the machine. And then I'm comparing it with the uh, actual label, which was put by the human beings. Machine says 72, and if the human says again 72, then I say that my machine uh, predicts correctly. So for this study, I uh, extract the features uh, with the help of some uh, NLP approaches because uh, we are dealing with bugs, which are strings, which are texts. So uh, we are making use of uh, natural language processing approaches. Uh, for example, TF-IDF and some other approaches to extract the features. So this is uh, just a view of the extracted features. I think it doesn't make sense to uh, check this image, right? Because it doesn't say too much uh, to us. But for a machine, uh, there are lots of hidden patterns inside. And the machines can uh, analyze these hidden patterns. And the uh, way uh, the data is distributed. And uh, the different colors represent the different levels. For example, uh, red samples are the sample two, uh, sever to two samples. Blues are the sever to three samples, and greens are the uh, sever to four samples. And this is the distribution of uh, the numbers of the classes in uh, this uh, study. Uh, I have mostly class two, uh, sever to two box, over 400. And uh, class three and four uh, near 300 and uh, uh, just over 100. So uh, after this distribution, this is the confusion matrix that I get when I uh, perform the uh, algorithm. So uh, it is okay. It is uh, somehow acceptable, but we see a bias on the left upper corner, right? The machine tends to predict as 72 because most of the samples were 72 so machine is tending to predict all of the samples as 72 and in this way uh, the uh, overall accuracy was uh, 73 percent as i told still it can be acceptable but it can be improved so what i did next is to uh, get rid of this bias i combined three and four together and on the other hand, I have several to two only. Does it make sense? Why am I doing this? Because now it is much more balanced. And actually, it makes sense in my project because in this project, several to two has a special meaning. If I have several to two bugs, it means that uh, several to twos are the release blockers. So deciding if a bug is several to two or not is an important decision for me. So I'm collecting all the other bugs apart from tools together, and uh, I'm putting uh, sever to two on the other hand. I will decide if a bug is sever to two or not. And in this way, the confusion matrix is uh, looking like uh, much more balanced, and the overall severity is uh, 82 in this way. And uh, at the end, it is uh, I uh, make a benchmark of uh, lots of different uh, algorithms, and uh, the best performance was uh, received as uh, 82%. But it is a difficult study, right? Because if we imagine uh, the 
uh, structure of the study. Then machine is saying something and we are comparing the results with the labels that are put by the human beings. But what if the human is wrong? I mean, when I'm putting a severity level into a bug, how am I doing? It is just my personal evaluation. I think about that and say that I think personally it should be 72. But maybe someone else will say that for me it should be 73. So it may differ from one to another one. Everyone in the team is not uh, putting the labels in the same way. So maybe the machine is more accurate. We are not sure about it. There is an there is not an absolute fact about it. So it is somehow tricky to uh, evaluate the success uh, of the algorithm. But at the end, we can say that uh, at least it can work more consistent, consistently. Because as a human being, I'm not uh, analyzing all the other bugs when I'm creating a bug, but the machine is doing that. So it is trying to uh, predict uh, consistently with the other samples. And of course, there are some uh, still improvement points uh, in the study, and uh, still the uh, accuracy can be improved in the later stages. And apart from this classification, in this one, we were uh, trying to classify the bugs uh, to different uh, severity classes. But apart from uh, classification, we can do clustering. What is clustering? I mean, I put all the samples in front of me, and I make some groups on the test. Uh, on the box. I collect similar bugs together on the same basket and in this way I'm uh, constructing some clusters and in this way I can get some insights. For example, uh, in one of the clusters I see lots of error words. So, so what I can uh, predict is maybe I can uh, regard all or uh, I can analyze all these uh, samples in this cluster and uh, how I can improve the bugs which are related to some different errors. Maybe maybe I can improve my error handling in the product, right? After I, I do this clustering, I can get some insights about the improvement points on the product and I can uh, concentrate on these improvement points on my product. This is just a visualization of uh, the clusters. We can see uh, different uh, similar bugs can be collected together. And uh, if they are heaping together on a specific feature, for example, most of the bugs are related to asset specific words, asset uh, management service. Then I can go to asset management service. Guys, I found lots of bugs heaped together on asset world. Please, can you check your configuration if there is something wrong on your service? So I can get lots of improvement points. Uh, after doing this clustering operation. So I'm close to the end of my talk. Uh, let's summarize what we discussed uh, during the whole talk. Uh, we discussed lots of adaptations of machine learning in different stages, starting from the analysis of the requirements, uh, continuing with uh, implementing of the test cases, executing them, and at the end, the maintenance stage, in which we are refactoring our code, or uh, maintaining our bugs, which are reported to uh, development teams or the product owners. So uh, in each of them, I provided some examples from different platforms or commercial tools. So you can regard this as uh, a benchmark as well, or, or a literature survey as well. So you can go and uh, check uh, how they are working. And at the end, I share the uh, case study in which I personally uh, try to classify the bugs in my project and predict the severity levels of the upcoming samples. And in this way, uh, we were able to decide if a bug is a release blocker or not. So we can really adapt machine learning algorithms in any stage of the software testing lifecycle. There are lots of opportunities. There are lots of alternatives to do that. So they all help us. They are all giving some insights about our processes and our products as well. So we can, uh, it is in our hands to make a good collaboration because I still do not believe that a pure machine effort will not be sufficient to do that, to perform all the processes, because at the end we need a human intervention. We need a human decision because we can collect lots of insights, but you should be the 
one who will decide for the end action item. But the key point is to uh, make a, and utilize a good uh, communication and collaboration to uh, machines and to human beings. And uh, in this way, we can do a much more efficient uh, way of working. So if uh, you have some questions, I will be more than happy to answer them.